Welcome, everyone, to our webinar on powder and liquid FEV coatings for curtain wall and infrastructure applications. Our webinar today is presented by AGC Inc. and part of the Metal Architecture webinar series. I'm Paul Deffenbaugh, Editorial Director at Metal Architecture Magazine. We're glad you've joined us. I'm going to turn over the controls to our speaker, Kristen Blankenship, in a moment, but I wanted to let you know how we'll proceed. Kristen has a lot of material, so we're going to hold questions until the end. You can submit questions in the window on your screen. I'll monitor them, and if there's an important clarification that needs to be made, I'll bring it up at the right time. In case you don't get your question answered, you'll get a follow-up email tomorrow. It will provide a link to a video of the webinar on our website. You can watch it again there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Many of you have provided your AIA number already, and that will be sent to AIA for CEUs. Those who need certificates or other documentation will get information in the follow-up email on how to get that. The email only goes to people who registered. So if you're sitting as part of a group, it's probably easiest to submit everything as a group. Um, now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Kristen Blankenship is the Business Development Manager at AGC Inc. Lumiflon. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry from the University of Evansville and has spent the last 19 years in the coatings industry. She began her career as an analytical chemist at Red Spot Paint in Evansville, Indiana, focusing on defect analysis. This experience allowed her to develop a unique approach to formulation with a focus on structure property relationships. She eventually became a UV curable coatings formulator at Red Spot and later moved up the chain to SciTech Industries, Inc., which is now Alnex as a technical service chemist in the area of waterborne liquid coating resins. In January of 2013, Kristen accepted the position of technical service chemist at AGC, Inc., based in Exton, Pennsylvania. And after nearly three years working with Lumiflon resins in the lab, she moved into a business development role. She now supports strategic accounts in developing high-performance coding and technology based on Lumiflon FEV resins. Kristen, thank you very much for joining us, and I'm going to uh, turn over the controls to you. Thank you very much, Paul, and welcome, everyone. And depending on where you are around the globe, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, the last webinar that I presented was uh, I was in Japan uh, at our parent company, and so it was uh, actually 4 a.m. there. Um, it's a little bit later here on the West Coast, so hopefully uh, I'll do uh, well uh, with having a little more sleep at this point. Uh, but anyway, again, uh, very, thank you very much for joining, and I will start um, with the... Um, AIA information. So if you've attended any of these AIA webinars in the past, you'll know that there's some um, slides that I must read verbatim, so please bear with me. AGC Chemicals Americas, Inc. is a registered provider with the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education Systems. Credits earned on completion of this program will be reported to AIA CES for AIA members. Certificates of completion for both AIA members and non-AIA non members are available upon request. This program is registered with AIA CES for continuing a professional education. As such, it does not include any content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by the AIA or AGC Chemicals Americas, Inc. of any material of construction or any method or manner of handling, using, distributing, or dealing in any material or product. Questions related to specific materials, methods, and services will be addressed at the conclusion of this presentation. The course format um, is uh, webinar-based, uh, and it will uh, allow for one AIA uh, health and safety and welfare credit hour, and uh, a copy can be sent to you by email upon request, and again, Paul has information on that. As far as the course description, it is a one-hour course, and in it we will discover the strengths and advantages of FEVE4 polymer top coats for bridges and curtain walls, as well as maintenance recoding of existing finishes. We will evaluate coating performance tests, including accelerated weathering and real-time weathering, and what the implications are for the life of different coatings. And we will also assess the life cycle cost advantage and sustainability benefits of FEVE top coats, despite their higher initial cost compared to other top coat formulations. And finally, the course objectives. 
Uh, at the end of this course, the design professional will be able to define FEVE and discuss FEVE coding technology history and unique weatherability properties, as well as its ease of application and extended maintenance intervals. Discuss real-time and accelerated testing of FEVE coatings that demonstrate their proven performance in terms of corrosion resistance and color gloss retention over long periods of time. To quantify cost and sustainability benefits of FEVE coatings regarding life cycle and the LEED version 4 rating system. And finally, to discuss guidelines for proper specification and explore several real-world applications. So now that I've got the housekeeping out of the way, we can get started. So we're going to start with a kind of a general overview of top coats and specifically four polymer top coats and how they compare to what we consider more conventional top coat systems. And before we jump into that, we have to discuss high performance coatings in relation to just a general coating system. Coatings, paint, if you will, um, are used on many, many, many things, probably more than most people realize. And a lot of that use is for aesthetics. And I think most of us are familiar with paint in that way. Kids in school, we paint for artwork, and then you know we buy homes and we paint the insides. And it's oftentimes an aesthetic um, that we're looking for with paint. When, what we're talking about today, especially with fluoropolymer technology, are high-performance coatings. And so these coatings tend to not only provide an aesthetic, but a function. And that function is protection, oftentimes, of a metal substrate or any substrate that's susceptible to degradation from the elements. Um, with metal, obviously, corrosion is the big problem. Um, and so using a top coat that can prevent that degradation of the substrate is critical. Um, we're talking about building structures and bridges here, but if you think about aerospace applications, uh, protection against corrosion keeps planes in the sky. It's that critical. Um, so paint and high-performance coatings provide a function that's very, very important to the end use of the, prod the aesthetic. Um, and on to considerations when selecting a coating. So you got to think about where the coating is going to be applied. Is it going to be in a factory or is it going to be on a job site? Are you applying it to a fresh substrate or is it a recoat of an existing structure? Um, so these are the kind of things that are actually going to impact the type of coating that you choose. Um, the chemistry involved in creating coatings um, it varies quite a bit and it allows for what we call curing or hardening or cross-linking of that coating in a lot of different environments. So if you're in a factory application, you can oftentimes use heat to cure the product faster. If you're obviously, if you're on site, you don't have a portable oven with you. So you have to allow just the simple ambient air conditions um, allow the product to, to cure or dry. Um, you also have to think about what kind of properties you're going to need. So for example, if you're talking about a, you know, a 80 story structure and the curtain wall for that structure, most of that structure is not really going to need a lot of impact resistance in use. It may need some damage resistance um, during construction itself, um, but it's not gonna be, for example, like a storefront where you're gonna get a lot of impact from customers walking in and out of the store. So that's where something like mechanical strength comes into play. And that actually impacts the type of coating that you're going to choose, because depending on the chemistry of that coating, um, you're going to get different properties. Um, but moreover, when we're talking about fluoropolymer coatings, we're really talking mostly about weatherability and how well that coating withstands sunlight and the damage that sunlight does. Um, and then, of course, secondarily, but equally important is its ability to prevent corrosion resistance of the underlying substrate. As I mentioned at the top of this section, we're comparing floor polymer systems to conventional systems. And that's just a word that we use to describe kind of the state of the art or the more commonly used systems. So for example, in a, a bridge application, it, especially a bridge that is over a major body of water, a salty body of water, a large steel bridge. Those bridges oftentimes are coated with a three coat system starting with the zinc rich primer and then an epoxy mid coat and then some type of top coat. And for high performance systems, that's usually a polyurethane top coat and possibly even a polysiloxane top coat. These systems offer very good corrosion protection 
primarily due to that zinc rich primer. Um, and also the top coat is really where you're getting your color and your gloss retention. And these systems offer, you know, basically a five to 10 year um, life cycle. Now, there's a caveat to this because it depends on who you talk to what actually life cycle is. Um, most people that I've spoken to in the bridge industry, they're looking at that coating to serve its function, not really its aesthetic. So for them, that five to 10 years is probably on the low end because as long as the coating is still intact and it's still protecting against corrosion, it's still lasting in a sense. When we're talking about fluoropolymer systems, because they perform so well and they maintain their color and gloss retention so well, um, we're kind of talking about how long does it take for that coating to noticeably change in appearance. And usually you're going to see that either in the form of a gloss loss, which is really just the shininess of the film, and then a color retention. And that's going to be the way the color shifts due to degradation from UV light. So that five to 10 years is more of after that amount of time, say, for example, a red color on a bridge, that red is going to start looking a little bit dull and possibly even pinkish in color. When we talk about fluoropolymer coating systems, it's important to note that fluoropolymers really are used in the top coat or the outermost layer because that's where the performance is really needed. So again, we go back to that three coat system on a bridge application. You're still using a zinc rich primer, epoxy mid coat, possibly, maybe not. It depends on the system. You might be able to go without it. Um, but that top layer is going to be a fluoropolymer. And that is there because that's really giving you the weatherability. So you really need it on the outermost layer. It doesn't really do any good to put it in a primer. Um, it's going to also act as a barrier to moisture and salt. So it's going to help kind of that epoxy midcoat and that zinc rich primer last longer and do their job of protecting against corrosion longer. And we're also, you'll see a term here also that I'll explain quickly, thermoset. Uh, it's important to use this term and clarify because there are other fluoropolymers in the market, which we'll get to in, in a moment. Um, most of the time in a top coat system using FEVE, you're cross-linking the system, much like you would a polyurethane or even a polysiloxane. And so those systems that are what we call cross-linked, they're basically hardened, and we call those thermoset. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the terminology there. And these thermoset fluoropolymer systems were introduced um, in the 80s and became widely used by the 1990s. As I mentioned, there are a couple different types of fluoropolymers that are primarily used in the coatings um, market spaces. PVDF, polyvanillidine fluoride, is probably the more commonly known, especially in the United States. It was introduced over 50 years ago, and it has had wide usage uh, for um, large monumental structures um, that require really good durability over a long life cycle. Um, these the traditional conventional PVDF systems were applied and still are applied using high temperatures. So they really limit usage in what we would call field applications or on-site applications. FEVE came along and it kind of changed that and it allowed for the usage of fluoropolymers in the field because the chemistry of FEVE allows it to cure or cross-link at room temperature. So you do not need ovens to cure these materials. So that allowed now to do uh, restoration, repaint, um, bridge coatings. Most bridge coatings are applied on site. Um, so it kind of opened up some market spaces where PVDF was limited to allow for that same kind of weatherability with fluoropolymers. Got one slide on chemistry, and for those of you that like chemistry, I apologize, um, but for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna keep it a little bit uh, succinct. But the chemistry is vital to the performance, and so when we talk about FEVE, which I've heard people call it FEV, FEV, FEVA, FEVE, um, I think there are more, uh, we just stick with FEVE, and we use that acronym because the actual chemical name is a little bit long and a little bit of a tongue twister. It's fluoroethylene vinyl ether. And really what that's signifying is this alternating copolymer structure that you see here in this little cartoon where you've got these blue spheres and green spheres. And what's important to really keep in mind with this picture in your head is that you have these vinyl ether 
components. These vinyl ether components in the, in it of themselves are actually not very weatherable. If you had a coating system that was all vinyl ether, it wouldn't last very long. But when you have this alternating copolymer where you have these fluoroethylene segments right next to those vinyl ethers in a very regularly repeating pattern, you end up with something that actually weathers phenomenally well. And of course, then you say, well, why even put the vinyl ether in there in the first place? Well, you do that so that you can do something that PVDF has struggled with, which is really good solubility in common solvents and the ability to form a film at room temperature. And that's what you get with this structure. This structure is not crystalline. PVDF is semi-crystalline, and that's where that oven baking is helpful to form a nice, good film and, and actually develop some of that crystalline structure. With FEVE, because it's not crystalline at all, you don't need any heat. So these things, again, they form a film all by themselves at ambient conditions. And that has all to do with the chemistry that you see here on this slide. So. Again, ability to put uh, the polymer in common solvents, um, so you can really formulate a lot of different kinds of paint, and then also the ability to form a film at room temperature, and that all has to do with the chemistry. So now that we got that out of the way, we can move on to some of the characteristics of these types of coatings and what they can offer for a structure. So number one is always excellent UV protection, and what that really means is these materials do not degrade significantly in, in, in a very small measurable way from UV light. So if you think of an epoxy system um, or even a PVC type system, you in your own experience have seen those things chalk and fade. Um, uh, old uh, headlamps on your car, they were made with polycarbonate and until we were able to formulate coatings that protected that polycarbonate better, you'd see hazing. And so that's really what's happening when that UV light hits those polymers, it actually breaks them. We call it cleaving. It cleaves the polymers. They form radicals. And then it's just this exponential degradation of the polymer. So the polymer is actually breaking apart. And what that ends up looking like in a macro sense is micro cracking. And that then contributes to the gloss loss. But of course, that micro crack cracking then basically makes your film not protective anymore. So UV protection is essential, and that's why fluoropolymers are used. FEVE chemistry is actually, it doesn't absorb any measurable amount of UV light. So it just essentially isn't breaking down because it's not absorbing it. It's transparent. And the carbon fluorine bonds in the polymer structure, uh, they're higher energy than the degradation that you would see from UV light. So I added a little more chemistry onto this slide, but we'll, we'll keep moving forward. Um, these materials have excellent color and gloss retention, as I mentioned, and also chalk resistance um, and good adhesion directly to metal substrates, which is a very important aspect of these um, resins because um, PVDF uh, really does need a primer for adhesion. Um, so that can limit some of the design um, that you can do with these materials. Because of the, the use in common solvents and the ability to cross-link, uh, much like a polyurethane system, they are applied using standard painting equipment. Um, the chemistry also allows for good resistance to cleaning solvents, so these materials can help with, say, on a bridge, um, you know, you can actually uh, graffiti them, but then you can remove that graffiti in a way that you wouldn't even know that it had graffiti on it to begin with because you can use really strong cleaning solvents. And because of the chemistry also, you can put these in water, you can have them in a powder coating form, and so you can meet the strictest air quality regulations. The benefits, number one in the architectural space, I know I've talked a lot about bridges, but we're gonna really focus on architectural now, is that they meet the AMA 2605 standard of performance. And the key to that standard is really 10 years in South Florida with greater loss retention than 50%. Um, that again, that's the excellent weatherability that we're talking about. Because these systems are that word I used prior, that thermoset, they're cross-linked, um, they allow for good mar and scratch resistance. They also are very water resistant, and because they're not degrading and forming those micro cracks that I mentioned happens when polymers uh, degrade from UV light, it allows them to provide really good barrier coatings for a very long time, which helps with corrosion resistance. 
So most of the time these are used in thermostat or crosslink systems. They are available in forms where um, they can be a, what we call one component system. So you don't need a crosslinker. And that's becoming more and more of something that's desired in the marketplace. Um, again, primer is optional because you don't really need it for adhesion. Where it's often used is for seacoast environments where you have um, a real risk of degradation from corrosion. And because of all this, they're ideal for curtain walls, facades, bridges, etc. And because their ability to cure on or in ambient conditions, they can be used for new construction or repainting and restoration of existing structures. The aesthetics, one of the things to keep in mind with these resins is that they are optically clear, um, and that allows them a couple things. They can um, allow for what we would call crisp clean colors because they are optically clear themselves and essentially high gloss. This is a little bit different than PVDF which usually offers kind of a matte uh, or maybe a satin gloss type finish. Um, but if you think about the resin itself being optically clear, it's going to allow for really bright vivid pigments to become, um, to maintain that vivid color because they're not being muted at all by the resin itself. And also because these resins are used in really common solvents that are very efficient at wetting out pigment, um, there may be a benefit with these in pigmentation. Um, and on, on substrates, we, we, we're going to talk a lot about metal because that's still used widely in uh, building and construction, although composites and plastic type materials are growing, fiberglass being one of those. Um, but as far as metals go, they're used on a wide range of metals, including aluminum, steel, copper, zinc. They could be used on glass, um, different types of plastics, and even porous substrates like concrete and wood. I talked about earlier what we would call types. In the paint world, we call them grades. So there are basically four main types or grades of FEVE resins. There's the very traditional solvent-based that are used for solution liquid coatings. There's also resins that will help with VOC. And those include um, what we would call kind of a flake resin. So there's no solvent included. And then those can then be um, solubilized in exempt solvents, water-based coatings, and then powder coating resins. As far as the performance characteristics, uh, as I mentioned, they can be used in a factory or in the field, and so they are often used to repair curtain walls and other architectural components, including metal roofing. So you, you may have an old Kynar roof, for example, and you want to recoat it with that type of fluoropolymer performance that's going to make it last just as long as it did with the PVDF, and so you can do a repaint with FEVE coating systems. Um, so we talk about FEV powder, they offer that same kind of performance. Now the powder version, they do need heat um, to apply because obviously they are in powder form, so they need heat to melt. Um, so that's really why they're done in factory applications, but they're becoming much more popular because they're essentially VOC free, um, inherently eco-friendly from just the VOC standpoint. And again, color and gloss retention for 30 plus years, um, if we go on to the application of, say, an FEVE liquid coating system, uh, you're really, the applicator is not going to really see any difference between an FEVE or a polyurethane conventional top coat system. And really, that does have to do primarily on the formulation itself. So, you know, we talk about FEVE resins. Well, these resins are part of a paint system. And depending on how that paint system is formulated, um, they can be optimized for um, application with a roller or a spray system, an airless spray system. So again, you can formulate an FEV system to meet all of those, you know, situations that you're going to um, see in the field. And so when we talk about evaluation of substrate, you know, we put this in here because anytime you learn about a new chemistry, especially in the coatings world, the question is always, you know, how can I reduce the amount of work that I need to do um, to paint the product? And number one that people always want to try to eliminate, and I understand, is the substrate prep. And I would say here, there's, there's, FEVE is not magical in that way, and I would argue that really there's no coating system magical in that way. If you have a metal structure that has some 
corrosion already existing, some red rust, for example, you need to remove that um, because it's just going to keep growing underneath that coating. So um, surface prep of a substrate is going to be no different with an FEVE coating system compared to any other conventional coating system. And at the end of the day, the better you prep that substrate, the better performance you're going to get. Um, that's just kind of how it works. And of course, performance really bears itself um, on adhesion. So you, you know, removing salt, uh, removing rust that's already occurred, and even roughing that surface up slightly so that you can get some good mechanical adhesion, those are all ways to ensure that that coating is going to stay on that substrate and protect it for a long, long time. So that was a little bit about liquid. We do have grades that can be used in powder coating applications. And again, because heat is needed to form the film with these because they're powder particles, so they need to actually melt, um, that they're used in what we would call OEM coating of aluminum extrusions. So these are factory applied, spray applied systems, um, and they use ovens to melt the powder down, and then they also use usually blocked isocyanates, so the heat is also needed to um, remove that blocking agent on the isocyanate, so cross-linking can then occur. So these are also thermoset coatings as well. They offer the same performance of a solvent-based system, that 30-plus year life, um, superior gloss to color retention, chalking resistance, and then, of course, the chemical resistance to air, airborne chemicals and acid rain. And of course, because they are factory applied, they're ideal for new construction. Um, and really the big benefit here is their zero VOC. Um, there's also a benefit from uh, a reclaimability standpoint. So this quote here, what's in the bucket goes on the wall. Um, we've got a slide next after this that'll kind of discuss that a little bit. But the powder application um, is a spray application, but it uses electrostatics. And really, the, the key there is that if you have your gun charged, those particles are charged, and then your parts are grounded, it actually attracts those particles to the part. And so you have much more efficient coverage. Um, and also, um, so a lot of these extrusions, they're, they're lineals, right? So you can imagine that if you have just a normal spray application where you're not trying to attract um, the particles, you're not charging them, then you're going to have a lot of waste, basically. Of course, one of the keys with powder coatings also is that reclaimability. So this graph here kind of just shows that, that again, what's in the bucket goes on the wall. And what that basically means is that in a liquid coating system, you have liquid, either it's a volatile organic uh, solvent or it's water, and it goes away to form the film. So, you know, if you have 100 parts in your bucket, only half, roughly, of that is actually going to be the coating on your surface. With a powder coating, all of it goes on there. And the key, and what something that people really like about powder, is that whatever doesn't get on the part can actually be reclaimed and resprayed. Um, so the transfer efficiency of powder coatings is is quite high. So now on to performance testing. Because these products, again, they're for high performance top coats, they're not just aesthetic, they're also very functional. So we do a lot of testing to prove that out. And also because these products last a super long time, well, you have to do some accelerated methods of testing um, to show performance. And so I'll be talking in the next few slides a little bit about that. So as far as weather resistance, ideally, you want to test these materials in the place that they're going to be utilized and for the amount of time that they're going to be utilized. That's ideally. That's not real world. Real world is that the paint companies are making these products. They need to get them to the market. And so what we rely on oftentimes is accelerated testing in conjunction with what we call real-time testing. That real-time testing is primarily done for North America, that market space in South Florida. Um, but there are other places uh, in Asia. Okinawa is a test site. Um, but you know, you find a site that's got really um, two main, well, two or three main things. But the two critical factors are sun, lots of sunshine, and wetness. Those two things, water and UV light, are what really, really degrade coatings. Heat is also a factor, but the water 
in conjunction with the UV light is what really tears coatings up and breaks polymers down. So areas that have that great combination, um, like South Florida, are really where people want to get um, testing done. But of course, it's real-time testing. So if you want a 10-year coating or a 20-year coating, you have to wait that long. So what paint companies typically do is they get panels out there and they've had them out there for quite a long time and then they use accelerated test methods to complement that work so they've got the coating out there that's been out there for 20 years they throw that in the accelerated test chamber next to their new version and they see how it compares and so that's really how accelerated testing is used as a tool to expedite the development process here you have a graph um, this is kind of how we look at it. We look at it as a function of um, exposure. We look at gloss retention as a function of exposure. You can also look at color retention. Gloss retention is easy to show because it's one number, um, and it's a percentage, and it, it goes down. That means you're losing gloss, and that means lots of things. But primarily, it means that the coating is actually degrading. And so that's what you're looking for. So here you have a QUVB, um, a pretty high energy bulb. And so that really tears up more conventional systems. And that's where you see that gloss loss over hours of exposure versus an FEVE coating system. Here you have what we call sunshine weatherometer. So it's a, basically another chamber where you have artificial bulbs that um, mimic UV light. This one is a little more representative of what sun exposure is. And so here you see a comparison of FEVE and PVDF compared to what we would call a conventional polyurethane system. So you're seeing that the fluoropolymers track very well, and you're seeing that not only do the conventional systems degrade, but it's that rate of degrade. And I always say that, you know, with fluoropolymers, it is likely that they will show that kind of extreme rate of decay once they hit enough um, UV light and exposure time to actually degrade that way because again it's a radical degradation so it's exponential um, but with floor polymers luckily we, we just haven't really seen it yet in a lot of our testing. Another method is uh, Xenon Arc and then there's this Imaqua test. Um, uh, there's another company that has a test called Q-Track. Um, they're, they're not the same but they are somewhat similar in how they test. Uh, on the Xenon Arc which is on the left you're looking at a FEVE, PVDF, and then again, a conventional acrylic urethane. Um, this is another chamber, different set of bulbs, tracks the sunlight, um, and you can see here 12,000 hours with the FEVE and PVDF, really good gloss retention versus the acrylic urethane. And then on the right, this test, um, it's done, whether it's Imaqua or q -Trek, it's done actually in a site in Arizona. And so what does Arizona have? It has lots and lots of sun. But what does Arizona not have? Lots and lots of water. So these tests have actually started just um, recently incorporating um, a kind of a wet cycle. Um, and they have to really be careful how they do this. And they have to really do it at night because in the daytime with that sun, the panels get quite hot. And so you're really just doing like a thermal shock to the panel because the water, it's just hitting the panel and evaporating immediately. And so it's really just the water being cool is just sharply changing the temperature on the surface of the coating. So again, it's more of a thermal shock mechanism than really a wetness. So what they're doing is they're doing the wet cycle at different times a day and also using some cooling techniques to um, make sure that that wetness cycle is, is longer because that really does impact degradation. But all that to say, these tests, what they do well is they actually accelerate natural exposure because they use mirrors to intensify the sunlight directly onto the panel and they actually track those mirrors. The mirrors track the sunlight as it goes across the horizon. So you're getting a more consistent UV exposure than you would in South Florida. Um, and it also is accelerated. So it's kind of a natural accelerated test. And you can get some really definitive results in only a couple years exposure versus South Florida, which takes about 10. You can see there's a little bit of a different way that we look at these. We look at them in radiant energy um, instead of hours. Roughly 3,000 megajoules is going to be people say <laughs> the conventional wisdom equivalent to 10 years in South Florida. Of course, the ultimate is the real-time weathering, and here we have some South Florida. This is what is required for the AMA spec. 
So the AMA standard, I should say, uh, requires that 50% of gloss retention after 10 years, and you can see both of these FEVE systems meet that. Here's some panels for a more visual impact instead of just the graphical way of looking at degradation. You could see at the top above that black line is the unexposed. So these were areas of the panel that were covered. And then the remainder of the panel was just exposed to the sunlight. And so what you're seeing is not only that the floor polymer systems, both FEVE and PVDF, perform very, very well. They perform well with what look to be more organic type pigments. Or, um, most of the time, a color like that that's going to look like an organic pigment, and these days they're using mixed metal oxide type pigments or ceramic type pigments. Um, you know, paint companies have done a lot of work to try to figure out what pigment systems are going to perform very well over time, and they're basing warranties on that. So they do a lot of that testing to make sure um, they're not just going to throw some organic red in there that's going to fade. Uh, really quickly. Um, that being said, you can still see where the chemistry of the polymer makes a difference. So that FEVE system in the red looks essentially as it did uh, day one, whereas that high performance polyester definitely fades. Um, in the yellow, you can see the FEVE and the PVDF. And I would say, depending on your screen, you may see a difference, you may not. I do on mine. Uh, but Needless to say, they both look good. Um, and then the middle, you have a dark color. And that's important because floor polymers, because of that carbon fluorine bond, back to the chemistry again, they do have good heat resistance. And so they're going to do well in a darker color. And I'm going to kind of start moving through these slides because I want to get to some of the um, environmental uh, regulations and then also to the case studies. Um, but so I mentioned that there's other sites around the globe where you can do real-time weathering. One of those is Okinawa in Japan. And so you can see here, uh, 12 years of exposure, uh, still passing that AMA standard. Okinawa tends to be a little um, closer. I think it's closer to the water, the test site. So it's a little bit more corrosive air and uh, might be a little bit wetter as well. Um, from what I've seen, the data I've seen, Okinawa tends to be a little bit harsher than South Florida. There's also um, work that has been done in the past um, using fluoropolymer thermostat systems. So again, an FEVE type crosslink system on an offshore platform. So these are oil rigs, basically. And of course, there's a lot of metal, a lot of railing, um, and these are coated with these systems. And they did a test site where they compared a traditional acrylic urethane or conventional polyurethane system to an FEVE thermostat cross-link urethane system. And they just measured erosion. So they measured film build at the start, roughly one mil. And then after 16 years of exposure, the acrylic urethane was essentially eroded away. So you can imagine if that happens, there's no corrosion protection going on at that point. Whereas with the FEVE urethane, you have 21 of those 25 uh, microns, so you still have very good corrosion protection. Here we have uh, another way of looking at performance, and that is using analytical tools. So here we've got basic light microscopy, nothing that complicated. What they did here is you take a panel, you slice it um, kind of on the vertical, and then you turn it on its edge so that you're looking at the layers of paint. And so on the right-hand side, you'll see the standard conventional polyurethane system. And what you have here is to the left of that image on the very top is this large gray uh, mass and layer. And that is actually a light sealed tape. So under that is an area of paint that's protected from UV light. And so just adjacent to that is what was exposed. And you can see that comparing the two, the exposed area did lose about one mil to uh, basic erosion from UV light and salts and moisture over about 15 years. I would argue that's really not too bad for a conventional system, but if you look on the um, image on the left of the thermostat cross-linked FEVE system, you see that adjacent to that light sealed tape where it was exposed, you really can't measure the erosion, and if you do, you may get a, a micron or two in certain areas. So that's really key to how these materials can protect against corrosion resistance because they're maintaining the film and it's intact and the integrity of the film is there so it can act as a barrier for a very, very long time. 
shocking is something that can also be looked at, and it's not just with white coatings. Um, you may old vinyl or old aluminum siding, uh, a white aluminum siding. If you had, you know, brushed up against it, you'd get some white maybe on your pants or on your hands or something. That's chalking. But chalking can happen with any pigment because essentially what's happening is the polymer that surrounds those pigments is degrading and eroding away. And then it's exposing those pigments unprotected. And of course, if the pigment is not encased in that polymer structure, it's just a powder and it just comes off on your clothes or into the air. So this is a chalking test, it's an ASTM test, and you can see that over, this is close to 20 years of exposure in an offshore marine testing station in Japan, that fluorourethane cross-linked FEVE system has basically the highest chalk rating, maybe a close to 10. So some of, some of the areas maybe had a little bit of chalk, but compared to the conventional system, um, you see a marked difference at only four years. Um, and then by 10 years, it completely chalked. Corrosion resistance. So we talk a lot about gloss and color retention, which is of course very important um, to the aesthetics, especially for an architectural structure, but corrosion is very, very key um, to the structural integrity. Um, so one of the ways that a floor polymer top coat can help with that is again, it can help protect those underlying anti-corrosive layers, that zinc-rich primer, because it acts as a barrier. And one of the ways that you can test that analytically is through electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. So this graph, it's, it takes a little explaining and I'll try to do that rather quickly, but what you're seeing um, on the x-axis is really four different categories, and the first is the initial, and then you're measuring the impedance. So basically you're measuring the ability of the coating to allow a current, an electrical current to go through it. And of course with a organic coating, you actually want it to be a barrier. You don't want the current to go through. So these all start about the same. All the chemistries, you know, these are all lots of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and of course with fluor polymer, you throw that in there. So they're about the same. Then you expose it to an artificial weathering test, that sunshine weatherometer for a thousand hours. So what you then start to do is you start that degradation process. Then you can see how it responds to a salt spray test. And we did it at 500 hours and a thousand hours. And so what you're seeing is as these coatings degrade, from UV light, and then when they have that exposure to salt, that salt, because that UV light has started that micro-cracking phenomenon that I mentioned, that salt intrusion starts to happen. And of course, if you have salt and salty water going through your film, well, now you can send electricity through it. So that's essentially what we're seeing here. And what you'll note is that red line with FEVE, it stays pretty steady and stable. And that just means that it's not degrading from significantly from the sunshine weatherometer test, so it's acting as a barrier longer. So that's really the key um, to how these materials can provide corrosion resistance. In the paint world, you know, <laughs> we have some ugly tests, and these slides are, they're not pretty, but they really show what goes on in a paint lab. So you take these panels, you coat them, these are steel panels, you actually scribe the coating, because you want to see the ability of the coating to protect from the corrosion spreading outside of that scribe. And here we're just trying to show that the um, commonly used polyurethanes and polysiloxanes for really um, corrosion environment, corrosion rich environments, that the FEVE top coat performs the same, if not a little bit better. As far as some of the standards that um, these materials are recognized by and um, you know, that we would say relate to how these products are used. ASTM is a big one. It kind of, you know, has all the different methods that all these other organizations utilize and reference. SSPC is used often um, for a bridge coating, uh, a lot of steel structures. Um, and then there's the American Water Works Association, the water tanks, and then finally AMA, uh, the American Architectural Manufacturers Association. They're the one that put out the standards, including the 2605. And a little bit on that, you can see here, um, 2603, 4, and 5. Uh, 5 is really the one where you need a floor polymer because it needs that 10 years of exposure with greater than 50% gloss retention. And here's some of the other categories for the test. And so now on the life cycle cost analysis. So floor polymers, they're a value-added product. 
um, value-added products usually have a different price tag than other products. Um, but you're getting something for that. And so one of the things that we like to show is that when you talk about a coating and a long-life coating, it's not just the cost of the, the, the pail or the drum. It's what value that coating is bringing to the overall structure. So if you take these three systems here, the alkyd, the polyurethane, and then the fluorourethane system, and you look at total repainting costs, and then you look at estimated coating life, you have a cost index at the bottom. And that's really your cost per square feet or meter, and that's per year. And so what you're seeing is that overall, a fluorourethane system is going to provide you much longer value. It's going to keep that asset that you have looking good for much longer. And it's going to save you money in the long run because you're not having to spend as much on repair costs and repainting costs. There's also a benefit. Um, and this just, again, kind of shows that as well. I, I want to kind of move through this because I want to get to some of the case studies. Um, so one of the things you can think about with, it's not just a cost, right? It's not just a monetary cost. It's an environmental cost. So if you think about the ability of a coating to not need to be repainted or repaired over time, well, you're not making more paint for that. You're not shipping that paint. There's all these other factors from an environmental impact standpoint that need to be considered. Um, this is just more data. This is a bridge that was done in Japan, and you can see that after um, you know several decades, you have a delta E of about three and a half and a gloss retention of 91%. So as I mentioned, sustainability, it's really what's important to really anybody in the building uh, markets now. And there are several ways you can be sustainable and have environmentally friendly coatings with FEVE. You can use those low VOC solvent-based uh, uh, coatings. Now, one thing about those is those require exempt solvents, which are really only recognized in the United States, and they're slowly being picked off the list. So really, we're going to probably end up with powder coatings and water-based coatings as being the primary options to meet those environmental regulations. So as I mentioned, when you're repainting a structure, you're, you're trucking material to a job site. You're blasting off the old paint and you're having to catch it. So there's a lot of waste and environmental impact. It's not just a cost play. So powder coating is something that's really become attractive in the sense of sustainability. The, the fact that low VOC is really first and foremost. Um, with FEVE, you can you can do it in one coat. You don't need a primer, depending on the area that you're in. You can reclaim and reuse that old uh, powder that didn't get on the part. So it's very the transfer efficiency is very high. Um, you know, when you think about an FEVE powder coating system, the ovens do tend to be a little bit lower um, than a PVDF system, so um, you can save energy costs there. Uh, but you do have the impact of the oven, which is why some people argue that you know, liquid coatings could have a benefit if they're low VOC. So I'm not going to get into that debate here. I think that that debate is ongoing in the industry, and it's a good debate. Um, but overall, from a toxic toxicity issue, powder coating really does well because it has no, none of the VOC. Um, so if we go down, so as far as lead, um, lead does not necessarily recognize the material itself. Um, as being green or eco-friendly or getting a credit, but it's how it's being used. So a couple examples, you could have a coating that um, offers heat island reduction, so you can use FEV in that type of coating, and also optimizing energy performance. So think of a cool roof or even a cool wall type coating where FEV can be used. Currently, LEED does not actually, in the material section, it, it's really a cradle-to-gate proposition and not a cradle-to-grave. So one of the things, though, that I've learned a little bit more from the powder coatings industry is that architects do seem to value powder from a cradle-to-grave standpoint, a long-life powder coating like fluoropolymers, even though LEED doesn't necessarily um, consider that when offering credits. And I think a lot of why LEED doesn't offer credits for cradle to grave because it's really, really difficult to study these coatings and materials once they're on a structure because then the variables just go through the roof, right, because it's real-time um, impact of the environment. So cradle to gate is a bull proposition. So on to the case studies here um, in the last few minutes that I have. Um, Again, with FEVE floor polymer systems, you have the ability, because of that chemistry, it's not crystalline. 
um, it's used in typical solvents or um, water, uh, they can be applied in the field. They do not need heat to cure the chemistry. Uh, of course, if you're doing a powder coating system, you do need that heat, um, so you can melt that powder onto the part and then also cross-link it using those block isocyanates. But, um, so that being said, in the next few slides, we'll go through some of the field-applied uh, case studies and then some of the shop or factory-applied case studies. As far as field-applied, we have this building here, um, they're listed out here. So we'll go to the Halliday Building in San Francisco, which was the first glass curtain wall uh, constructed in the United States. The metal components were primed with an epoxy and then followed up with what we call an aliphatic polyurethane. That just means it's not aromatic like an epoxy. Aromatics don't weather well. Um, and then, of course, floor polymer was then a finish coat. So this is a system where it was an epoxy primer it's, so it's a three coat system, but it's an epoxy primer with a polyurethane mid coat and then a floor polymer top coat. Here's a Skokie Hospital, which uses a porcelain panel. And so the FEVE top coat would be on that panel system. Joe DiMaggio's Children's Hospital. This is a, an ACM, aluminum composite panel. And one thing I like to mention on this slide is that you can see these bright colors, this red, this orange, and this green. Of course, most of the structure itself is a neutral tone. And this is where you can really look at where you need the performance. So on a neutral tone, you may not necessarily need a 2605 type coating for that because that tan color, as it degrades, it's going to be more tan or less tan, however you look at it. And it's probably going to degrade pretty evenly. Um, so you know, you may specify something at, you know, a 2604 level for that. Where you would want a 2605 level, in my mind, is that red striping and that orange striping and that green striping, because that's a signifier of that structure. It makes it stand out. It makes people know that that's Joe DiMaggio's Children's Hospital. And you know as well as I do that when you go by, say, a fast food restaurant or, um, you know, a hotel chain and you see that the paint is fading and it looks old, it kind of just gives you an overall sense as a consumer that, you know, the establishment is not being well kept and things aren't looking really good. So I would argue that on these branding colors or these signifier colors, symbolic colors, if you will, uh, 2605 grade floor polymer is really the way to go because it's going to keep those colors looking pretty much exactly the same as they are for as long as that structure is in use or at least until it gets changed. Here's an example of Erie on the Park um, where they did some repair work. So uh, this is in Chicago. They took a zinc rich primer, pretty thick build, and then they just went right over it with the floor polymer coating. In Washington DC, this was an office building on the curtain wall. Um, that needed some repair, so they used an FEVE system. This is where a water-based floor polymer actually can be useful because some of this looks to be on the interior of the building. And so using a water-based system is going to allow you to not have to cordon off that section that you're repainting. Um, the, the public can still utilize it because the water-based systems are low VOC, and they usually don't smell as bad. CNA building in Chicago, another curtain wall system. This is an epoxy with another polyurethane mid coat and then a FEVE floor polymer top coat. On to the factory applied. So these are all going to be powder coating systems. Um, in the factory applied space, in the extrusion space, there is a lot of liquid PVDF because, again, that requires a factory um, application, but the powder is usually FEVE. Um, so that's kind of how the market is now. It, it's, it's, it might be changing, um, but right now, if it's a powder coating, it's, it's likely an FEVE system. Um, so this is the tower at PNC Plaza in Pittsburgh, and these were coated with a FEVE powder top coat. And again, it was a one coat because FEVE has great adhesion to metal without the use of a primer. And to that point on metal substrates, one of the great things about an FEVE powder is that you could use it direct to metal. So if you want that brushed metal look or a metal look to shine through, you can use that a clearer or a tinted FEV system, and it allows for that because you don't have that primer system um, that's providing any color. Um, so that's an application where these materials can really be useful. Here's some fiber cement substrate, some more fiber cement. 
So these are more of a, a porous substrate, if you will. More ACM panels. Richmond City Hall. And the bridge, Skydance Pedestrian Bridge. This is in Oklahoma City. Ferrari World is one we like to show a lot because it's a pretty iconic uh, structure and has that really bright red Ferrari red color. And floor polymers help keep that bright red uh, Ferrari red for a long time. The Burj Al Arab, another iconic structure. Eiffel Museum. So in conclusion, FEVE can be used uh, for curtain walls and bridges because it can be applied in a factory setting or in the field because you do not need heat to cure these materials and that's all due to the chemistry of the resin itself. They can be used in new construction where you would have factory application or in rehabilitation. Um, they offer a wide range of color and gloss options because the material itself, again, the resin chemistry itself is high gloss and optically clear. So it allows you to really make bright, vivid uh, colors and then you can kind of dial in the gloss that you want. So you don't need super high gloss. Um, you can mat it down to whatever level you want. But if you want some high gloss areas to make something pop, you can do that. Because of the different grades that they're available in, either the powder form or the water-based, you can meet VOC requirements. And because they last so long, they really offer not only a monetary cost advantage in life cycle terms, but also uh, lowers the environmental impact. So by now, uh, you should be able to define FEVE and discuss FEVE coating makeup, history, and unique weatherability properties, as well as its ease of application and extended maintenance intervals. Discuss real-time and accelerated testing of FEVE coatings that demonstrate its proven performance in terms of corrosion resistance, color gloss retention, and long life cycle. Quantify cost and sustainability benefits of FEVE coatings with regard to life cycle and the LEED version 4 rating system. And finally, discuss guidelines for proper specification and explore several real-world applications. So with that, I think we have a few minutes for questions. If, Paul, you want to send some over to me. Uh, Paul, if you had any questions, you can uh, send those my way. If not, um, we are going to be getting your questions uh, in a, a printout form, and I will try to answer those questions directly and email you directly. Um, so I really thank you very, very much for your time and attention, and I hope this was informative for you. Um, and I hope you'll listen in on some future webinars. Thanks again.